Engaging citizens, a game changer for development? Crowdsourcing public policy with Beck Novick, director, the Governance Lab. Hi, we've talked up until now about different forms of engagement, both thick and thin. We've talked about some of the rationales behind why to engage with people. What I want to do today is to focus a little bit on practical tips and tricks, strategies for actually undertaking engagement. These strategies are from the perspective both of citizens, but also from the perspective of institutional leaders who might want to actually engage with people. So I'll present them a little bit from both sides. Hopefully the suggestions are useful to everyone involved. But I have to start with a caveat, and that is that engagement, whether we call it crowdsourcing or open innovation or whatever name we use, is really very new, especially when we do it online in many of the techniques we use today. And therefore, we don't fully have all the answers about what works well, in which contexts, and when. So we have to try things, see what works, and learn from them. We have to start also with an admission. And that is that most people believe, let's be honest, that citizen engagement doesn't work, it can't work, and that we're too busy to make it work. From the government perspective or the institutional perspective, we often think that there's not enough hours in the day to hear from all the people we have to consult. We don't think citizens will participate well, that they don't have the time to do so, and they don't have the cognitive capacity to provide the kinds of answers we need to hard challenges. From the citizen perspective, the fear and the concern is that government leaders aren't going to listen. It's a waste of time. Who's actually going to take advantage if I can give of my time to participate? Nobody's going to care. And especially in this day and age when we have so much email to answer, so much uh, social media that we have to respond to, the phone ringing off the hook, not enough hours in the day, can citizen engagement actually be practical and make a difference? I'm here to suggest that it can. And what I want to do now is to spend a few minutes on 12 strategies that I think can make citizen engagement really work for all of us. Number one, this may seem obvious, but it is the hardest point to follow. That is, start with a problem. If you don't have a real problem that you're trying to solve, you're not going to get answers that are useful to you, that are helpful to you, and that are going to come in a form in which you can make use of them. Take, for example, the issue that the Air Force labs faced in the United States, the very dangerous and real problem of out-of-control vehicles speeding towards a checkpoint. Trying to stop those vehicles, often when the military and the people driving the car don't speak the same language, is leading in unnecessary casualties both to the driver and to innocent bystanders. It's a real and it's a hard problem. And the Air Force Labs put out a challenge and got a really great solution, a simple solution, which for a few thousand dollars enabled them to tackle the problem that was provided by a retired engineer in Lima, Peru. Came up with the very simple idea of essentially attaching an airbag to what amounted to a toy car that could be rolled under the vehicle, inflated, and then tip over the car. The point is not the story. The point is that they had a really hard and real problem that they were so trying to solve. And we might find that both from the institutional side and the citizen side, that in the process of actually trying to frame the problem and define it, we might actually in that process discover real solutions and come up with a way of framing the challenge such that we will get answers that are more useful to us. In addition to starting with a problem that you're really trying to solve, my second advice is to think about crowdsourcing and engagement as a way of expanding the toolkit that's available to you for solving problems. It's not simply a way of getting ideas into your own hopper to make decisions. It's also a way of pushing out the problem to others to allow them to participate in solving it with you. Take, for example, the colleagues I've worked with in Canada tasked with the goal of remediating social exclusion, which leads to significant public health problems, particularly among immigrants in Canada. Rather than think only about what they could do and how they, in their position as government officials, could solve the problem, what they did was use their convening power to bring in citizens, advocacy groups, universities, and others to participate in defining how everybody could play a role in solving the problem and to get everyone to step up and make commitments for what they might do. So again, think about it as expanding the tools in your toolkit and using your convening power to get in those new voices and ideas. Number three. Keep in mind that when we consult with people, it's not only to get their opinions and their feelings, but also to get their good suggestions, concrete advice, and practical strategies for solving problems. 
Often when we talk about citizen engagement in a democratic context, we think about it as a legitimacy building tool, hearing from citizens what their feelings are about a particular proposal. But in this day and age, especially with the availability of new online brainstorming platforms, collaborative drafting tools, we can actually engage people to provide concrete and practical solutions to hard problems. Number four, when we think about engaging with citizens, it's not only ideas that we can get and opinions, it's also data that we can get help with gathering. Think about what happened after the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster in Japan. A citizen group called SafeCast had citizens go out and measure the radiation, not on a national level, not even on a citywide level, but on a street-by-street -street level, measuring the radiation high up in the air and low down on the ground. Think about the work that Public Labs is doing all around the world, giving citizens instructions in how to develop and create balloon cameras, attaching a balloon to a camera, flying it high up above your neighborhood, so you actually measure and sense the conditions in your own community. This is what many people refer to as the citizen science movement. It's actually engaging citizens in the process of gathering air quality data, water quality data, and other information, often about environmental conditions on the ground, that can help with solving problems better and helping us to understand what the conditions are, what the real reality is of life in our own backyards. Gathering data is one form of what we might think of as task-based engagement or crowdsourcing. So we can think more broadly about the idea of actually asking people to go out and do something. This is what TED has done. TED provides these wonderful free lectures online that can really help people to build their storehouse of knowledge. But what TED has done is turn to volunteers all around the world to help translate those lectures into dozens of languages to enable that knowledge to get diffused more globally. So as you think about engagement, recognize that it not only is what we think about in the policymaking context, getting people to supply ideas, opinions, or feelings, but it can actually involve the process of getting people to go out and undertake tasks and do hard work. Number six, try crowdfunding. We typically don't think about asking people to give money as a form of citizen engagement, but this is increasingly a way that people are participating. In addition to giving of their time to undertake tasks like gathering data or sharing ideas and suggestions or opinions, one of the forms of engagement is crowdfunding. Take what Space Hive is doing in the UK. In the city of Manchester, they raised 38,000 pounds or $50,000 to get members of the community to raise the funds for building a municipal Wi-Fi network. They've recently raised money to help with the prevention of a very much beloved public building, which was otherwise going to be demolished. Now, taxpayers do pay taxes, but there are still important public works projects which don't get funded without contributions and crowdfunding is one way to engage people in their own community. Number seven, as we think about engagement, remember that employees and civil servants are also people that can be engaged. So from the institutional perspective, as well as from the citizen's perspective, it's important to realize that even people within the walls of our own institutions, whether governments or NGOs, are often those people we fail to engage, but they have sometimes the best ideas about how to solve problems in new ways in light of the very real experience they have on the ground doing the day-to-day -day work of working with citizens and delivering services, for example. So take, for example, what's happened starting a couple of years ago in Lahore, Pakistan, where there were tens of thousands of reported cases of dengue fever, and in the year prior to the start of the program, 350 reported casualties. Then they went out and gave smartphones to municipal employees and asked them to spot and take pictures of instances of mosquito infestations allowing the city to do a better job of eradicating those mosquitoes. And within the course of one year, fatalities went down from 350 to zero. Think about engaging employees within the walls of your own institution, not just those outside of it, as a way to practice engagement. In order to engage people effectively, however, it's important to share what we know, to open up the data that we have in order that they can participate in informed ways. If you simply ask them a naked question, you will get an ill-informed and often unhelpful response. Therefore, whether you're a government official or whether you're a citizen, you need to demand that the data relating to the question that's at issue be shared and opened up. Number nine, hold events in real space, hackathons, ideathons, wikiathons. So we know that often when government agencies make data available, they sometimes get technical people, geeks, and nerds together to actually build software apps to solve real problems and challenges. 
But in addition, don't only think about the technical people, think about getting other people together to come up with solutions to problems, to dig in on a particular challenge, and try to devise real solutions. This can be done often in real space gatherings, sometimes complemented by online engagement. But sometimes that getting together in real space with people from your own community about solving a really hard and important public problem is the best way to engender enthusiasm for tackling it. When a lot can't be, a lot can't be accomplished in one day, we can combine face-to-face -face with online engagement to connect people online in between face-to-face -face forms, face-to-face -face happenings and engagement. Number 10, it's important to create incentives for people to participate. Whether it's getting to them together in real space and serving snacks and having them enjoy the fellowship and community of their neighbors, but it might also be a prize or some kind of monetary incentive that actually gets people out of the woodwork to participate in solving a problem. It could also be the glory of meeting a government leader or the thrill of getting a t-shirt or of really just the enthusiasm that people gain from solving a problem where they can really make a difference and that speaks to their talents and abilities. There is no one right answer for which incentive works in every circumstance. Sometimes it'll be a prize, sometimes it'll be a t-shirt. But we have to always keep in mind what are the right incentives and what are the possible incentives for solving different problems in different contexts with different audiences. Number 11, perhaps one of the most important of all, implement what you learn. In addition to having a very clear and concrete problem that you're trying to solve, it is essential to be committed to implementing what people tell you, or at the very least to explaining why you haven't implemented. The biggest disincentive to engagement is for people to feel that what they say and what they do doesn't matter, that no one's listening, and that it's irrelevant to the outcome. So before you ask, be sure you're prepared to make use of the answers that people give you. This is why it's so significant that in places like Latvia, and in places like Argentina, they have now introduced legislative uh, drafting systems in which citizens are allowed to participate in the legislative process and, more importantly, representatives are committed and required to actually consider what citizens suggest, to take up those proposals and to review them. I can assure you that if that were not the case, participation that might be robust at the beginning would quickly drop off. People have to feel that on an ongoing basis their participation is relevant and that it's going to matter. If we really want to institutionalize engagement over a long haul, we need to be sure that we're prepared to make use of what people actually tell us. Finally, number 12 is what I refer to as crowdsourcing wisely or smartly, not just crowdsourcing broadly. We often think about citizen engagement as being done either, as we've heard, by random sample or by throwing out an open call to everybody to participate. But this isn't often, and in many cases, the most effective way to engage people. When we're trying to consider an issue about education, we really want and need to hear from the teachers, the parents of ch school children, the children and students themselves. So we shouldn't hesitate to actually target whom we ask and invite specific people to participate. This is not to say that in a democracy, we don't also have to take all comers. We don't also have to have ways of listening to everybody. But that doesn't mean that we have to avoid the opportunity to target whom we ask, to go out there and try to find the people with the specific know-how that we need. If we want to move to a world of active citizenship, if we want to truly engage people, then first and foremost, we have to take seriously what people know, their skills, their abilities, and their know-how. If we ask them, more likely than not, they will be willing to share, particularly if we provide the right incentives, especially the incentive of listening to what they have to tell us, taking seriously their input, using their ideas and advice, and making use of the task that they've done for us and the data that they've gathered for us. It's important to get out there and do it. We don't know fully what works, but the important thing is that we have to try, we have to learn from experience, and we have to try again. Treating engagement not as a one-off opportunity that we use to manage a crisis, but that we use as an ongoing technique to make governance not simply more legitimate, but also more effective for solving problems and for tackling the challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you.